at the push of a button, depending on whether or not you're good little boys and girls. And if you're getting into a system where all of the infrastructure of financial clearing is in the hands of the bankers, that's not a system you want to go into. You look at the West, and more importantly, if you look at what some people call the Anglosphere, the, the Western powers that are English speaking, the United Kingdom, Canada, United States, and so on. I do think it's the case there. They're using a health crisis really to drive a, a political agenda. And the health crisis itself is largely blown way, way out of proportion to what's actually the case. If you look at what Mr. Globaloni is up to, they are recreating slavery. And the, the thing that is unique about slavery is they now have the means of perfecting the capital because now they can literally implant your body with the means to track you. It's not going to go away overnight, but there are already uh, I think some hopeful signs of cracks beginning to appear in the edifice. This is Joseph P. Farrell, and for all the news the media doesn't like you to hear, tune in to the other side of the news. Welcome back to the other side of midnight for this Sunday night. My guest this morning is Max Hawthorne, and we're talking about uh, denizens of the deep, things that most people never imagine. As, as I said in one of my promos that I wrote earlier, um, if you listen to this show, you may not want to go swimming in the ocean for a while. So, Max, why don't we talk about this this Carnival Cruise Line thing in 2014, where you have a whole shipload of, of uh, people, you know, enter on vacation, having fun, and something approaches the liner that is not normal. Well, let's see. Um, so the Carnival Cruise Monster, which was a, a moniker I came up with after I interviewed the witness, um, was seen by a group of people on board the luxury liner Carnival Breeze in 2014, and this sighting took place in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I don't have all the details at the top of my head, but it's 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 all on Monsters Marine Mysteries. But um, so the the key witness that I spoke to is a nice guy from the UK, and. Uh, He's, uh, his name is Paul George, and he was working on the Carnival Breeze as a fitness instructor, and he was on the top deck of the ship. And he was called over to the railing by a group of passengers who were pointing at something down below. And they showed him uh, this very, very big sea creature that was swimming next to the boat, next to the ship. And they asked him, what is that? Do you know what that is? And he looked down. <laughs> and, yeah. And, uh, and you know, these, these ships, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these people didn't have their phones with them. Because, uh. Well, he did, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay. But uh, because they have a lot of, uh, like, aquatic stuff up there. 
you know, like people in bathing suits and whatever. But anyway, and he looked down, and he said that there was this gigantic sea creature swimming along beside the ship, keeping pace with the ship. Okay, now keeping in mind the ship swim, uh, swims. Whoosh! As part of my research, I had to track down their cruise speeds and a lot of other information. So they're swimming at like I mean, uh, there. Sorry, the cat just started clawing my chair. Huh. I'd, um, you're going to get it, Olaf. Believe me, I'm going to feed you to the Carnival Cruise Monster in a minute. But um, <laughs> So the ship's regular cruise speed is like 21 or 22 miles an hour or something like that. Right. Um, so this thing was able to keep up with this ship without any problem. And he said, Paul was familiar with whales, whale sharks, sharks. He'd seen all, you know, he worked in the industry for a long time. He'd seen everything. You know, swimming next to in front of the ships and stuff like that. He was quite familiar with sea life. And he said this was nothing that he'd seen before. Um, he described it as having, he only saw its head, neck, and its upper back, as he put it. Um, and the portion that he saw was at least 50 feet long. And he was able to compare that in terms of size to their 37 foot lifeboats that are directly below and that he'd seen during practice sessions in the water next to the ship. So this thing dwarfed one of the lifeboats, and he was only seeing maybe half of it. Hmm. Okay. But uh, he said that it was so large that when its back broke the surface, it reminded him of a submarine where it oh would come my God. Would stream <laughs> off of it. Like ah. that. Yeah. Wow. Um, he said what it color had, was it? What color? It was like, like a semi-glossy like blackish or super dark gray with a little bit of flecks of like lighter colors here and there, like an orca in part, um, or more like a um, not, well, the, the sort of like an orca or like a leatherback sea turtle, okay. you know, but dark. Okay, um, and he said the head was like that of an alligator. It had a thick neck, Good and grief. then what he described as being immense like traps, as he calls it, you can see under the surface, like, sticking out like wide, and he believes those were like pectoral fins or something like out like stabilizers you know to hold it in position but a uh, very broad ma- he's, he said he goes this thing was massive I, I mean you gotta see the size of it it was like this thing feared nothing it was a top predator out there nothing it would eat a white shark like it was a snack and That's they're exactly steaming along in open ocean with tourists at the rail looking going oh my god what's that and he could not say what it was, okay? He said if it wasn't for the fact that it had a head like an alligator, he would have thought it was some sort of gigantic sea turtle or something. Mm-hmm. But he said it was definitely was not a turtle. And I guess it wasn't a squid, it wasn't an, you know, because that was my thought. Maybe it was some sort of... Well, yeah, but turtles squid. are roundish, not longish. Right. Yeah, it didn't have it didn't have a shell, that type of thing. It was smooth. It was very smooth. And, uh... Sorry, just getting a swig of the tea here and uh, giving the cat the evil eye. Um, but um, <laughs> I knew I should have left the door open. I was too soft-hearted. But um, so, and what happens is, is th- there was a lot of interesting points that he, when we discussed all this, I did multiple interviews with him because I really wanted to pick his brain. And I've revisited this, this incident with him many times. I've come back at him with more photos. So this happened animals. in 2014, but you were able to talk to him when? Uh, the last time I spoke to him was just a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. So it's recent, recent, I mean, recent. Okay. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, uh, I mean, this is over a period of like two, three years that we've had these conversations. And uh, so he said that it he couldn't see what's propelling it. It wasn't using its front flippers or whatever was under there to move it because, you know, you would have seen it. Right. He said the water around it churned a bit like you know as it moved and, but he believes <laughs> like it, it had was, a prop uh yeah like was were propelling it was uh, theoretically under the water so it sort of seemed like it had a long body and like its upper back neck and head was up the rest of it was kind of draped under the surface like a like an immense crocodile when they come to the surface and the part of them like sort of hangs under a little bit or something and when it exhaled and this i thought was very curious it didn't blow like a whale. There wasn't this like, and then like, you know, this. You do that very well. Thank you. Well, my <laughs> mother-in-law makes noise like that when she, no, never mind. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so glad the wife's asleep right now. Yes, yes, uh, you know? okay. And she's not a subscriber of yours. So oh, good, good, okay. But, um, so... Well, this but, almost, it, I mean, look, at first cut, it sounds to me like we've got a, an, an extinct creature out of time that's in a contemporary ocean where it doesn't belong. Where did it come from? Is it part of a line which has been secretly living on the Earth for millions of years? Or... And this is a really wild idea. Are there literally holes in time, Max? Because I know there's a, there's a story from out here of a giant condor-like bird, much right. bigger than a condor, which was reported by Native Americans that appeared and then disappeared. It's almost like they're doorways through space-time, and these things can materialize on Earth from somewhere. But they're not living here as part of a species that can you can track down because they're just visiting. The Well, I'll, I'll tell you more about the animal and my theory on it. Because the interesting thing that about the like its behavior, it sounds like a reptile. And not just because of the, he said it had a head like an alligator and all this stuff. But when it came up for air, instead of it blowing like a whale, he said the water around its head turned white. And Oh, like bubbles seen, were coming out. Like, but lots of them. Lots of them. And if you see like a sea turtle when they surface for air or a crocodilian, they do the same thing. A lot of like just release the air, it comes out in little bubbles like around the head and then their nostrils or blow hole in this case breaks the surface, they inhale and then they go back under. So it exhibited respiration. It was definitely an air breeder, and its its respiration mode seems more like that of a reptile, like a marine reptile, instead of a cetacean. Mm -hmm. So then what happened is, but its head never completely came up, okay, just enough that it could get a breath or whatever, et cetera. And then they were looking at this thing, like, I don't know how long it was for, 30 seconds or a minute. It, it, it's in the book. There's even a drawing he did of it and some sketches I did back and forth stuff but uh wait wait wait, wait, wait. It, i thought there uh, were pictures oh i'll get, do that too then but uh he took a photo of it with his cell phone as it veered away and it started to swim away from them and then in the uh, next port of call he got into a donny brook yeah i think he, in a port side bar or something and yeah. his phone it, uh, no phone lost oh no yes but i did put in the the pieces and i will say this here on the air if anyone out there because he said there was a few other bunch of people with him like a handful of people and one or two of them he thinks had phones but if there was anybody else on that ship that took a picture of this thing by all means reach out to me on social media or on my website okay Maxwell so give give the name of the ship Give the location where it was. Give the dates, and we reach all. We reach a hundred and some, hundred ninety some countries. So, who knows? So the ship was the Carnival Breeze. The year was 2014. It was in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was in the late summer slash early fall. So it would have been August or September, something like that, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, but if you saw something that big next to your ship and you took a picture of it, you don't know what it was. Reach out to me. Get me the image. Let's talk. Okay. Wow. So, yeah. So then the thing, it, it swims away. And as he put it, like, it, nobody out of care in the world. You know, <laughs> he felt it was going back, yeah, to, to where they came from. I think they came out of Miami or something. It's, it's all the details are in there. But, um, and it, from the description and from the stuff we've gone back and forth and images, stuff, it sounds like some sort of gigantic mosasaur. Like a, I don't know what species like Mosasaurus hafmani or a member of the Prognathodon genus or something like that. Um, the build, the physique, you know, all this stuff. I mean, but this would be a ridiculously large Mosasaur, okay? But there have been historical incidents where creatures like that have been reported called whale eaters by people. Like Russian whalers have seen creatures that size stalking, harassing whales and stuff. And the Monongahela back in the 1800s, a whaler killed and rendered a creature, like I think it was 100, 200, three feet long, something like that, that sounds very much like what this creature was. So 
the uh, and they, they they just gave full measurements head neck circumference you know how many teeth it had you know uh, everything it's a, a fascinating story the Menangahela but um which is not in my book I mean it's just out there people can just you know look it up but um so there's so many been scores of sightings of mosasaurs or mosasaur like creatures off of New Zealand and stuff a lot of people think there's a hotbed if these if these creatures are still out there I mean whatever this thing was it wasn't a submarine it was an organic life form. It appears to have been some sort of immense reptile. And maybe there are a handful of them eating at a living somehow. You know, I have another weird idea. <clears throat> you know the controversy around the whole coronavirus thing. And uh, Redfield, you know, was former head of the CDC under Trump. He thinks it was created in a lab in Wuhan and it somehow escaped. Right? What if there are labs doing biological DNA tinkering to produce unusual life forms and one or more or some of them have escaped and that's what the weird interference cover-up is really all about because no one wants to be hung for doing something that creates a planetary monster or a group of them that was done by human you know, experimentation gone really, really wrong. It anything is possible. I mean, I have stuff like that in my Cronus Rising Kraken books, where they're doing experiments on people with prehistoric DNA and things of that nature. So, I mean, nothing surprises me. I mean, word came out about UFO technology being used, you know, for military research or development. I think recently they were talking about that. So uh, anything is possible. I mean, people were, you know, they want to clone mammoths. They want to bring back the cave lion, which I'm all in favor of, by the way. I'd like one of the, as a house pet. But, um, <laughs> Olaf, do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Say hello to my naso little friend. You know, like 600 pounds of cat coming well, with this, you, with this, with this, with, with, with CRISPR technology, all the stuff that we used to think of as science fiction – Going mm -hmm. back to Jurassic Park, it's not. And the, and the whole COVID thing has kind of unveiled this whole CRISPR technology, which is the double-edged sword. It's the classic mm -hmm. Frankenstein dilemma because it can be used for incredible good or, I mean, we know there are psychotics and nuts working for the U.S. government and every government, right? If they yeah, have enough I money... And they have unaccounted for money, you know, these special operation programs to do bizarre things. Who knows what can be done given that the mainstream technology now says it's possible? Well, I mean, I, I'd like to think that Mosasaurs are still hanging on. Yeah, but if so they were, wouldn't we have seen them through the centuries? Why would you have a, an incredibly rare appearance and then I, there have been a lot of sightings, and they go back hundreds and hundreds of years, some of them. But people were easy to, eager to dismiss these things, etc. I mean, in the last hundred years, in the last 50 years or 60 years, there's been dozens of them. But I think that, first, if you're dealing with an animal that, let, let's just go on the assumption that it's possible, they could reach that size. I personally own a fossil that proves that mosasaurs were potentially the largest marine predator of all, at least that we know of. I mean, my fossil suggests that at a minimum, they reached 85 feet in length. Mm. Okay, this, this creature would have eaten a megalodon shark for dinner. And I'm not kidding. Okay, I'm mean, eating it. Ripped it apart, ate its liver with fava beans and all that jazz. Okay, but you're talking about a marine reptile that's superbly adapted to the water. First off, it doesn't have a, a swim bladder like fish do, okay? And most marine reptiles, like plesiosaurs... Which is to regulate its buoyancy so it can go up right. and down in depth. Right. And marine reptiles, plesiosaurs, crocodiles, all ingest gastroliths. These are stomach stones. And that helps them with their buoyancy, so they're negatively buoyant. So when they want to sink, they just exhale, release air, and they can sink easier. When one of them dies, it is not going to float to the surface. It's going to sink automatically. 
They're and, not like whales. And relatively quickly decompose, which is why we don't see skeletons. And when, when a carcass gets to the bottom, it's ripped apart by scavenging sharks, hagfish, squid, octopus, everything and anything. So if these creatures are alive, there's no reason why you're going to find a carcass. It would be very, very rare. They're not like shallow water predators. They're out in the, the deep sea. And Unless they're chasing cruise liners. <laughs> well, you know, I think this thing, assuming everything is only up and up, was the alpha predator. And it was, you know, just cruising along, looking to see what this giant moving object was. And then once it decided it wasn't a threat or a rival, I mean, it would be tiny compared to the ocean liner. I've seen the Carnival Breeze. I, I took some, a photo of it. I put it in the mm. book. But, um, you know, it would have been tiny compared to it. But And it's funny because there's a scene in my first novel where my pliosaur encounters a cruise liner and actually snatches a, a would-be suicide victim off its railing, leaps up and eats the poor guy. Oh, my God. Right before <laughs> his girlfriend had talk, was about to talk him down and he was going to change his mind, and then he got eaten. So anyway, yeah, so, you know, life imitating art or vice versa. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's possible these things are air breathers. They're not like whales. They don't make a lot of noise when they, you know, to come up. This right. thing was dead silent, stealth mode. So if you're in a boat, and you see a, a back of something come to the surface, you're going to dismiss it as a whale because it pretty much looks like a whale unless you're right on top of it. You know? And if they are real, I mean, they still exist, and do they're these, flesh eaters, you don't want to be right on top of it. Do these guys make noises underwater? I couldn't tell you. I, I mean, there is an, one incident of a, of a young man who claimed that his boat was attacked by a pair of them. They were small, like 20 feet long or something like that. And they were trying to get him off his boat, and they ripped his boat apart. And people laughed at him and mocked him about it and said he deliberately destroyed his own boat, but he had no insurance. So mm. that made, made sense. And that he wasn't looking dumb. for publicity. Yeah. So, but, you know, there's been a lot of... Lot of well, the reason I'm asking that is because we have, you know, we've now wired the world. You know, Russia, China, the United States, the SOSIS network, underwater hydrophones that are very sensitive. You can do frequency analysis. Remember the hunt for Red October and the Caterpillar drive and the unique acoustic signature? I wonder if you could have access to those records through, like, um, you know, Freedom of Information, whether you would find weird undersea sounds that would replicate so you could almost get a signature and then you could trace back what the sounds were coming from like species that we think are totally extinct mm -hmm. well I, get, I have one juicy bit for you on that oh right good now. good good I love juicy bits and I, I don't know the exact frequency I, I, I use this um, in one of my, I think the first Cronus Rising Kraken book but um, there is a known sonar frequency out there, a biologic frequency, not a man-made one. And it is not a whale's range, It's, but it's close to it. And when whales hear this, they panic oh. and they rush to the surface. Oh my god, that's exactly what I'm thinking. And whalers have used this frequency, replicating it, to to drive them in a certain direction. Right, to, to get their prey. So, whether wow. this sonar emission is like from the extinct raptorial sperm whale mm. Leviathan, and these whales are instinctively still afraid of it to this day, or if there's something else down there that emits this frequency, and when they hear it, they run for their lives. Um, it well, does. It's a known fact. It's well, given that you're fact. dealing with an underwater environment, and I'm thinking of, of uh, you know, porpoises, dolphins, and whales, sonar, sound. Sound is kind of like the, the vision underwater down below a few hundred feet. It's pitch black. One would imagine there would be a cacophony of species communicating or sensing each other via sound. So if you had a really sophisticated network with a computer on it that could filter out the various frequencies, you could you could categorize a whole bunch of weirdness that then could be followed up on. Yeah, if this if there's a way to somehow track this one type of frequency, this type of sonar that's emitted by whatever is doing this, 
then that would be a way to locate it. And whether it's a mosasaur or some sort of unknown cetacean or what, whatever it is, whales are afraid of it. Okay, have you Even heard? Big whales. Ha, have you heard the sound? No, no. Darn. I just happen to I happen to know that I, when I was doing research for the, one of my uh, Cronus Rising books, I came across it and some research stuff, and I just you know tagged it on there as you know as part of the story that these. See, this being radio, sort of the I would love you to say, "Oh, it's right here. I'll just press this button and we can hear it." I mean, come on. I did, didn't even expect to be talking about it, to be perfectly honest. But Well, do you know I, where a record exists? Could we get a record and play it? I, well, I can try and Google it right now. Was it the, was it the Navy that recorded it? Because the SOSIS network is, you know, looking for Russian submarines and, you know, um, the various sounds of propellers and, you know, the attack class and the boomer class and all that. So they have an incredible library, I presume, of underwater sounds the question mm-hmm. is how do you get at them without revealing you know sources and methods because you don't want the russians or somebody else to know how good we are but if this just kind of came out of nowhere in other words how did you hear about this i research constantly okay so it's part of the open source without an attached sound clip I'm trying to go into one of my novel manuscripts to see if I can find it for you. Because I might have some of the data in there. Because that would be incredibly cool. Radio is sound. All right, while you're looking for that, if you can walk Mm -hmm. and chew gum, and Olaf doesn't attack you again, let's talk about super predators. Um, Mm -hmm. You have a friend named Gary, and Gary has Mm -hmm. a friend named Earl. And there was this sighting of this huge uh, turtle that you think uh, is what ate, a, a, you know, what you call an alpha shark. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Um, I, ha- I have the information, at least a little bit of it here. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Um, no, 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 no. This is this is conversation. So let's see here. Uh, so when her, okay. I'm just, I don't want to re- bother reading from the book to bore people. Um, <laughs> let's see. So it says here, cycling at a frequency of around 3,000 hertz, which is the same frequency whalers discovered many years ago that panicked cetaceans into coming to the surface and made them easier to kill. So the frequency of 3,000 hertz frightens whales. That's the frequency. Hmm. Um so if there's a way for us to dig further into that, et cetera, find, refine it, et cetera, that's the, uh, hmm. you know, but that's the, the range right there. And that doesn't seem to be the range of a sperm whale's sonar, which I examined in Monsters and Marine Mysteries, because there was, that was related to an incident where that destroyer was attacked by the squid, et cetera. Um, the super predator thing is that, um, I think this is 1969, I could be misremembering it or something, but two fishermen... Um, Gary passed away years ago, a few years back, but um, I got to speak to his good friend Earl and interview him at length and all. And they were leaving out of, I think it was Vancouver Island, um, that's, you know, West Coast, Canada, that area. And Gary was the first one out, and his friend was a mile or two behind him, and he, Gary started radioing him. He said, get out of here, hurry up, come on, come on, come on, there's a sea monster and stuff. He was very excited. And so Earl was putt-putting along with his boat and got out there. Gary was like a kid in a candy store. He had a Super 8 film camera, which in 1969 was the, the, the smartphone of today. Okay. Break time. Right. Again, I've done it. I've been too wrapped up in your uh, intriguing Sorry. story. No, 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 no. This is good. Being wrapped up is good. My guest this morning is Max Hawthorne, and we're talking about Mysteries of the Deep. Hear the ocean? You want to go in the water soon? If you're far from land and something is out there? You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return.
the other side of midnight.com talk radio with pictures on demand liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non-linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio with pictures on demand. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone. Sunday night. Actually, it's uh, Monday morning here in the land of enchantment, which is very far from the ocean. If you listen carefully, you can you can just hear the surf breaking. My guest this morning is Max Hawthorne. You know, I keep wanting to say Max Headroom, <laughs> and uh, that's not a good thing. We but, did that the last time. Yeah, I remember. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and uh, So, okay, let's talk about the super predator, because anything with the word super, you know, NASA's even gotten into the act. They have one of the instruments on the Perseverance rover. Uh, the, the previous iteration on Curiosity was called ChemCam, which is very accurate. You know, describes what's going on. Now, because it's the improved 2021 version, they're calling it the SuperCam. So talk to us about super predators. Well, the, uh, the whole super predator thing relates to an incident from years and years back where a uh, three meter or so pushing 10 foot white shark, great white shark, off of the, the coast of Australia in the Bremer Canyon was apparently uh, consumed by something very large and fast and obviously dangerous. If you're going to eat a 10 foot shark, you've got to be pretty sizable and pretty fearsome yourself. Um, my theory on the super predator is related to the incident I was starting to touch on in 1969 on Vancouver Island. Because these two fishermen, they encountered what they described as a ginormous, well, they didn't say ginormous, but I'm saying that, <laughs> but a, a shellless sea turtle that was 38 feet long. Well, wait, a shellless sea Meaning turtle? Meaning it didn't have like a big bony shell like it was a, like, like a, a like, like a carapace. Leather leather yeah okay yeah like more like a mixture of a of a giant turtle and a sea lion or something mm. like that um it was uh it was enormous now i mean all the details of uh what do you, um the, the the sighting are in the book but basically when i got to speak to earl about it because you know, thankfully he's still with us um he said that by the time he got there, the creature was no longer on the surface, but it, it had sunk down, and there was like a an uprising under them, like a point coming up off the seafloor, the seabed, and this creature was sitting on the sea the seabed on top of this outcropping under their boats, like they were like looking down at it, and it might have been I think like 30 feet below them or something like that. And he said it was like a palish gray color which matches what Gary Lamada had uh, described. And he said it was literally as big as his boat, and his boat was 38 feet long. He said he was frightened, he was afraid if it got angry or came up under them, it could have done, you know, obviously a lot of damage. So, Don't make it angry. <laughs> yes. But, uh, and then when it took off eventually, Gary described it as being capable of, quote, terrific speed. So the thing was fast moving, and when Gary saw it before Earl showed up, and he videoed or videotaped it, he filmed it with a super great camera. Um, it was sort of like on the surface, rolling around, doing stuff, frolicking it and stuff. And it, it stuck its head up out of the water and stuff like that. Um, when I saw the, the footage initially, I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, it's some sort of amorphous, unidentifiable sea creature because the, the footage was so um, deteriorated at that point, seen so many times that it was almost like a silhouette. You know, mm. Dark, very you know, out of focus, the car. And 
What so year? I, what, what 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 year was this again? Sixty nine. So they didn't have digital technology. They didn't think of making a another no. print so they could run a print and then make another copy and none of the pres uh, preservation techniques you would do was something amazing. <clears throat> right. Don't. He showed it to his kids many times, oh. actually, and, you know, which you know also wore out the the, the, the original film and stuff. But it was on a. T But, um, and so I, 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 I didn't know what this thing was. You know, he described it as a turtle. I, I was hoping it was one of the pliosaurs from my novels. Like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we're still out there, baby. But, um, so I took a, a couple of frames from the, uh, footage and I, you know, just did a little enhancing on my computer, like, like adjusted for lightness and you know, stuff like that. And boom, I'm looking at the head of a turtle. Oh. I mean, it was, there was no missing it. And, and you know, when people see the book, you'll, it's in well, there. Well, you can but, enhance um, old film with digital tech. Look at how they keep remastering, you know, classic mm -hmm. movies. So, yeah, you apply current contemporary technology. There's data to be pulled out, and you did it, right? And it's undeniable. I mean, it's not crisp, because you're not going to get crisp with a, you know, 52-year-old uh, thing or something like that. But you can see the eyes and the, the ridges of skin under the eyes and the brow ridges and the beak and you can see like the folds of flesh underneath the chin coming down and stuff like that and the thing is big its head and neck alone was eight feet long and it literally stuck its head up out of the water and you can tell it's looking at the cameraman <laughs> filming, which is a little disconcerting i was gonna say <clears throat> dinner yeah because this thing is probably a piscivore it's a, a, a fish eater fast moving uh you know streamlined and big Okay, so the whole super predator thing, when the, this incident with this shark, which they called Alpha, Shark Alpha, um, Alpha got chased down and eaten by something. Okay, and and was where was this? Place? You mentioned something called Bremer Australia, Canyon. The Bremer Canyon. Okay. Right. So I came up with this controversial theory after I saw the first super predator documentary years back, and I didn't believe. Like, they, they were saying, oh, it was just a 16-foot white shark that killed and ate the smaller shark, okay? And in the book, I show silhouettes of comparing a 3-meter shark and a 16-foot shark. And you can see, obviously, the, the larger shark could never consume the smaller shark. It was just too much of a meal, okay? It's impossible. They believe Alpha was swallowed whole. But in addition to that, a 16-foot shark couldn't even catch a 9- or 10-foot one because of the fact that the bigger sharks get the slower they get. And a great white's peak speed, which is some say is 30 miles an hour or stuff like that or more, is when they're smaller. The larger they get, the slower they get. Their cartilage slows them down. I mean, I, I think the number crunching for a 26 footer would be a speed of like a maximum of 12 miles an hour. <laughs> Okay. No, that's just the way it is. Whale sharks are not fast. Basking sharks are not fast. It's just the way it is. If your skeleton is rubbery, you can't flex enough power like a whale can. Like a blue whale can still swim at 30 miles an hour because it has bone, a bony skeleton. So anyway, so I, I was looking at all this stuff, and I didn't buy that for a minute. They were claiming that they, you know, they, they take this thermal scan or this handheld like FLIR type thing, and the 16-foot white shark breaks the surface, and they boop, pull the thing and say, oh, it's, its core temperature is the same as the Super Predator, 78 degrees, okay? And I'm like, wait a minute. So this white shark in cold water, okay, its back just breaks the surface, a wash in cold seawater, and somehow your little handheld thermal scanner is able to go through the shark and into its stomach under all that cold water and tell me that its stomach temperature is 78 degrees I'm like i'm finding that a little hard mm. to leap, you know and none of the stuff matched the the once this like okay so a white shark is able to create a maximum temperature differential between its stomach and the surrounding seawater of 25 degrees fahrenheit but the super predator exhibited a 32 degrees temperature differential between its stomach and the seawater. Higher, you know, by eight, uh, eight degrees or whatever it is. Okay, so it's not a match in terms of temperature. And then there was other things, like just the speed and catching the fish and eating it. The digestive system of the super predator, it took eight days to excrete the tag. 
whereas a white shark's digestive system maxes out at like 80 something hours like like three days so whatever this is it had a slow long digestive system with a higher internal temperature than a white shark could generate in 40 degree seawater so none of it was like making sense oh and the tracking tag lest i forget also acted like it wait, was wait, wait. A tracking tag well yeah, well, the thing when the reason they know Alpha was eaten was she had a, a satellite tracking tag. Oh, on her okay. and so when she was consumed, the predator swallowed the tag also. Oh, it was what the it? stomach. Wow. Acid. And so they knew the temperature of the super predator's stomach. They knew it took eight days to digest. They also knew wait, where wait, they, the super, they, they they knew it because of what telemetry. Well, when they, they, it radios to a satellite, and when it was pooped out, all the data was in there. Oh my God! What an incredible. Uh, serendipitous Alan. thing. That didn't sound very scientific, but I have a child, so I, I speak like that. Understand. Yes, yes. So, the other thing was that while it was digesting alpha, the super predator, as it's called, its swimming depth ranged from the surface to 300 feet. It didn't do any deep dives anymore, see? So, its swimming depth was suggestive of an air breather and is pretty much the exact same swimming depth of a killer whale. You know, that's their range, the servers down about 300 feet. Okay, technical it, question. Was sure. was the uh, transponder able to transmit through the the uh, super predator's skin, or did it have to wait until it was excreted? They, the tag washed ashore, the satellite transmitter. I see. And it was found, It was and it was way earlier than it was supposed to, because it was supposed to last a long time and stay on the shark, and then... But it came out early and it showed up and then they realized it was it's it's covering was acid etched meaning stomach acid yeah. and then when they got the data and everything they found all this weird stuff on the satellites so the uh so it whatever it was and it they knew from here. the number that it was from that shark yes the so-called alpha exactly. yes ah good good so, tagging basically yeah. so satellite tagging yeah yeah and the uh so you're dealing with an animal that like orcas have a body temperature like ours. It's like 98 degrees. So it's not an orca because it was 78 degrees. Right. Okay, It's not a shark because it was too high in that cold water to be a shark. It's an air breather. It's got a long See, digestion. The coolest part of this, uh, Max, is we've got real data here. Mm -hmm. Real, real data, not someone's, you know, stolen camera report. You know, this is, right. this is wonderful. This is exquisite. Mm -hmm. So what happens, and I mean, I'm not remembering all the details word for word, but, you know, whoever gets the book is going to have this treasure trove of data in front of them <laughs> and stuff. But, um, and it's not a pitch. It's just, you know, we only do so much in this show. So what what was weird was, so now I'm thinking, okay, this sounds more like a reptile did this, you know, because I've kept pythons and boas, and I know it takes like, them sometimes a week to digest a meal and excrete it. Etc. And so then I start looking into it, and I'm thinking pliosaur, mosasaur, something. But research indicates that their body temps were as higher higher than that of cetaceans, 98, 100 degrees. Mm. So that kind of ruled them out. The only animal that I found that seemed to fit the bill was the leatherback sea turtle. And le there are scientific studies which I put the evidence in in Monsters and Marine Mysteries. The leatherback is able to sustain a 32 degree temperature differential between itself and the surrounding seawater exactly the same as the super predator's temperature moreover a leatherback's digestive system is six times as long as other sea turtles so that would suggest that a creature that was leatherback like let's say might also have a very long digestive system hence taking eight days to consume and completely digest a very large fish and excrete the tag. Okay, mm. so I put all this together, and oh, and leatherbacks are also very fast. They could swim at 22 miles an hour. A bigger, more a predacious turtle could swim undoubtedly even faster. And they're world champion deep divers that can go down 5,000 feet, which would could easily catch a shark. She was Alpha was caught around 18 or 1,900 feet down running for her life and this is all from the tag the satellite data from yeah. the tag wow yeah wow. And there, were, there were two documentaries that talked about this one of them said it was a bigger white shark the other one said it was <laughs> megalodon that one was ridiculous you know megalodon was living in the abyss and it came up and and attacked her and took her down and ate her and then went back to the abyss 
And I'm like, okay, well, now now we're in fantasy land. I don't know who's trying to get a plug out of this, but the tag shows that the Super Predator stayed at the surface at 300 feet for the next eight days, so that doesn't wash. No. Okay. Yeah, and it also shows that the Predator chased her down, caught her in the deep water, and then went back up. So it didn't start in the depths. You know, no, no, all this not. nonsense. No, no. Not to mention a Megalon can never catch a 35 mile an hour nine foot white shark. Okay. So anyway, I was left with just this turtle. But that was crazy because leatherback turtles eat jellyfish and they don't, you know, prey on sharks. And a shark would more likely try and prey on one of them. But after I saw that image from Gary Lamada's turtle. You know, and I realized that he basically gave us proof that a 38-foot streamline, apparently fish-eating turtle exists. That was like the missing piece of the puzzle. And this, to me, overwhelmingly suggests that the super predator is some sort of very large, undocumented, fish-eating turtle. When you, when you keep saying undocumented, way. it's like we've got documentation, but it's not being believed. Well, it's, you know, because I'm just, I'm just an author. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I, I mean, know the feeling. Once we, we get a documentary <laughs> on this and put it out there, it'll become more mainstream. And I'm sure, and I have documented many sightings of these turtles in Monsters and Marine Mysteries. It's not just this one thing. There's a whole slew of sightings of these creatures, and they behave the same way. Sticking their head up out of the water, looking at people, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Mm. One of them may have even been responsible for some human fatalities. So, you would not want to be in the water with a, a turtle the size of a See, bus. See, I that knew that my anything. prescription about you wouldn't want to go ocean swimming for a while after the show was probably on, on point. <laughs> Yeah, well, you See, know, all right, if, 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 if these things are air breathing and they spend a lot of their time kind of close to the surface, a few hundred feet, why don't we have specimens? Why don't why didn't somebody run into one? Why hasn't somebody caught one in a, in a, in a net? Why, why is it, you know, I know, can, I can see how the deep creatures would be elusive because they're, when they die, they fall to the bottom and they're eaten. But why don't these guys turn up in ways that we can actually catch one. Well, number one, we're dealing with the same issue what I, I mentioned about mosasaurs. You know, this is not an animal with a swim bladder, etc. It's a reptile, and when it, it, it has stomach stones or anything like that, once it dies, it's going to sink, possibly. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, leatherbacks, I'm using them as a reference, can stay underwater for hours at a time. I mean, they 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 when they come to the surface to respirate. It's not going to be like like a whale once again. It's going to be a minor thing, and the animal is going to stay on there. I mean, sometimes they sleep on the bottom for seven, eight hours at a time. Mm. Literally. Haven't you ever seen the video of a, of a sea turtle lying down on the bottom and yawning and stuff? You know, because they are able to do respiration not just through their lungs. Sea snakes get 20 or more percent of their oxygen through their skin. Turtles are undoubtedly capable of doing the same. Some turtles engage in clavicle respiration. So, uh, you know, the, if you see frozen ponds and stuff like that with big turtles on the bottom, the turtles stay there for months under the ice without breathing. They're getting air hmm. from somewhere. You know, it's being absorbed through their skin and other means. They're just not super active. They're doing what's called brumation. It's like hibernation. So they're literally splitting oxygen from the water? Yes. Do we know that oxygen. biochemically? Do we have an actual laboratory, you know, tracking of how this works? It is documented that sea snakes do this, and it is documented that turtles do a variation of it. Like I said, called clavicle respiration. So it is, I'm sure, that these turtles are able to absorb a percentage of their oxygen through their skin, because otherwise, how can they, how can a turtle sleep on the bottom of a frozen pond for three months? Very quietly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, they don't expand a lot of energy because yeah. if they did, their oxygen needs right, would be right, so great right. that they would suffocate. So it's kind of like way. a semi-hibernation. Yeah. I mean, you can Google like an alligator snapper under under ice, and you'll see a 200-pound turtle lying under frozen ice there, and it's just chilling. Very it's, it's funny. Very easy funny. to see. 
So, but yeah, my belief is, and the evidence strongly suggests, I mean, everything fits for this turtle to have been the one to chase down. Now, you're not spirit. saying this is a leatherback. You're saying it's a no. relative? I, I'm or... saying it's what Gary filmed. And I gave it the name Titanicellus lamati after him, which means basically oh. Lamata's Titanic turtle. Right. See? And that's what the name it, it deserves to have because he provided pretty much proof of it. Wow. So, the, uh, but, I mean, there's not going to be a lot of these animals. I mean, I've been out at sea hundreds of times. I've seen, well, except in areas where, you know, people go to see sea turtles, you know, like in Hawaii and stuff like that. But I've out shark fishing and stuff. I've only seen one turtle once. It was dead. And it was bigger. It was a loggerhead. And it was far larger than the known world record. I mean, this thing was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Dead, upside down, floating on the surface. It must have been 2,000 pounds, if not more. Maybe more. Mm. Much, much bigger than the accepted world record for that species. So, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, I mean, there's nothing about... Actually, it's funny. Even in one of the documentaries, they were out there trying to, you know, provide proof of the super predator, and they got a, a sonar reading of something swimming hundreds of feet down, slow moving, okay, that they said was 35 feet long. And they dismissed it as being a whale. <laughs> but I don't think it was a whale. I think it was one of these turtles, and they just didn't bother with it. You know, they said, oh, that's no, probably a whale. That's what they said. You know, but, and slow moving. Now, if you think about it, a sea turtle, when it's not in a hurry, how do they swim? Slow. Mm -hmm. you know, they got no cares. And an animal that size has very few natural enemies. Only killer whales, and that's pretty much it. Hmm. Well, I must say that this is incredibly interesting, primarily because there's real data. Do you happen to remember, it's probably in the book, the number of channels, the number of different measurements, the transponder, the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the, that was excreted, was able to record? Um, I don't have all of that off the top of my head. I know I can tell you the temperature differential. I can tell you how many days the tag was in there. Uh, tag, a lot of tag, yeah. Yeah, but uh, all, as much data as I could glean from there is in there. I replicated a chart that showed like her pattern of swimming, like alpha, up to the point where she was attacked and such, and what happened afterwards. Actually, something that wasn't even covered in the shows is apparently this super predator made more than one run at her. And I say that because on one of the documentaries, um, and I saved a screenshot of it, of course, in, in all my research, you see the, the point where they show where she does this deep, deep dive and then she gets nailed, okay? And then the tag comes back up and then it starts changing in terms of behavior, like, like I said, like an air breeder for the next eight days. But in the days prior to that, there are two or three other incidents where Alpha was swimming along and all of a sudden she dove super deep. She dove super deep hmm. multiple times. And I don't think if she was there to prey on, doing that to prey, I think she was running for her life. Because it's a documented fact that when killer whales kill a white shark, this happened on the Farallon Islands there, all the other white sharks in the area got out of Dodge. They sensed, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they sensed somehow that one of their kind had just been killed by orcas. Well, they probably talked and, to each other. And the satellite tags from one of them showed it dove to 1,500 feet once that happened wow. and swam all the way to Hawaii. At 1,500 feet? Yeah, 1,500 feet, because orcas can't go that deep, they, and they can't oh hunt that my, deep. My, my. Okay, so, see, this raises an interesting question, because mm -hmm. it's kind of like the uh, line from Casablanca. Mm -hmm. Of all the gin joints in all the world, you know, what are the odds that a tagged satellite-transmitting shark mm -hmm. is going to be eaten by a super predator which no one has ever been able to document. Oh, I'm sure that it happens all the time with the sharks. I mean, that's a, a regular size. Well, that meal means there has to be a big, years. big population of these super turtles, right? Well, I don't think there's a big population because if you look at other huge predatory things, like for every lion out there, how many thousands or tens of thousands of wildebeests are there? Mm -hmm. So the apex predators are very few in number compared to their prey, that's just how the numbers game works. They in other just, words, they're they, limited by their food source, but sharks are very plentiful. Right. So they, they are plentiful, but that doesn't mean what eats them is going to be plentiful. 
Hmm. Well, if that's their primary source, why wouldn't they be? In other words, if the population size is determined by the food source, mm-hmm. you have a very plentiful food source, why doesn't the population size of the top predator grow in proportion? Maybe there's a lot of them out there. I mean, I documented, like I said, six or eight incidents mm-hmm. that strongly suggest, as people like to say in scientific terms, that the... Uh, you know, there's a lot of these turtles out there. The latest one, hold on, it's very recent. Let me try and find it for you. Yeah, I'm just while you're doing that, I'm just thinking out mm-hmm. loud here. It makes it more and more, uh, shall we say, prudent to stay far away from the deep ocean as you can for a while. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's see. Looking something up. Uh, this is the part of the movie uh, where you see typing on computer screens and images coming up. Okay, here we go. Got it. So, and obviously, now these animals are not all going to be big. I mean, the it's probably, this thing probably gives birth to live young. And uh, Wait, wait, so, wait, 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 wait. Don't turtles lay eggs? They do, but they discovered a fossil recently, which they said could be a mosasaur fossil, where the egg was like a very soft membranous type thing and when it was expelled into the sea then what was in the egg would just break free and it was born which can suggest then that a turtle could do the same thing in fact that fossil may even be a turtle Hmm. they haven't confirmed that it's a mosasaur okay but so if a turtle lays a soft enough egg in the water it's still laying eggs and the membrane just parts Hmm. and there you have your juvenile but uh so the, this one I call the Sackinet Sea Monster, because that's what they were calling it also. And this happened in Rhode Island in 2002. A woman named Rachel Carney, she's out there swimming, and all of a sudden, she feels something pass under her, and a oh, huge oh. head the size and shape of a basketball. Don't you hate springs. it when that happens? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this was in the news, though. You could, you could see the news report and stuff of it. Okay, so this thing with a recessed lower jaw and it was like pale underneath. It submerges, starts circling her. It starts brushing against her. She's terrified, swimming for her life, screaming for her fiance who swims out there, grabs her and throws her and says, "Swim for it. Don't turn back, no matter what, etc." And the, the the fiance sees this thing, and it it's he says it's 15 feet long, and scaly. Okay, hmm. uh, its head breaches the surface. He described like she did the head the size of a basketball, if not bigger, with four inch fangs and the lower oh, and upper jaw oh, and fangs. layers of fangs inside. Now wait, the fangs that he's talking about are most likely the papillae, like these backward pointing, like hard, sharp things that leatherbacks have in their mouth and throat. A lot of sea turtles have it, so they, when they swallow something soft like a jellyfish, it's a one way ticket because it all points backwards down the throat. Right, okay. right. So I don't think he saw actual fangs because he said layers of fangs aside. Mm-hmm. I think this was it was definitely a turtle. It uttered a hideous hissing sound. Water sprayed from its mouth and nostrils. He retreated to dry land. Okay. Hey, but hold so it there. Being... We are at the bottom of the hour. My guest this morning is Max Hawthorne. We're discussing monsters of the deep that do not stay safely, obviously, in the deep. And where do you hear what's coming up? We're going to talk about mega sharks. Here on the other side of midnight, my name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return.
the other side of midnight.com. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone, to this Sunday night, Monday morning, the other side of midnight. My guest this morning is Max Hawthorne, and we're discussing whatever lives in the 80% of planet Earth, of which we know so little. You know, I keep wondering why um, James Cameron, when he made that deep, deep dive into the Marianas Trench, and he reported at the very bottom 35,000 feet below the glittering surface of the Pacific, there were life forms. We know so little, and yet we think we know, we pretend we know, we have pretensions that we know so much. Max, talk to us about mega sharks. <clears throat> well, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> you 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 researched a story from one that was apparently seen in what 1918. Uh, well, yeah, I, we we discussed that one already. The uh, oh the oh, the, 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 the Port Stevens. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. That that not, in my opinion was just a, an albino whale shark ah, that okay. blundered into some lobstermen's traps and scared the poop out of them. Okay. And stuff like that. There but we it, go again. But it, but, but, it, but it makes a great segue into you say you collected evidence that supports mm-hmm. the existence. Of these yes. huge things, yeah, and in, in, in go ahead. Sorry. No, in Monsters Marine Mysteries, I put a whole section on mega sharks. There's also one about megalodon and whether it's still alive or not, and if not, what else is out there. Um, I collected a lot of evidence, and I worked my way up the food chain in terms of size based on different encounters, sightings, etc. Um, one of the Examples for example, uh, well, there was one I wasn't able to use the photo because they didn't want to, you know, uh, allow it. Let's say I think they realized I was onto something. But uh, there was an incident where the some shark experts photographed an 18 foot white shark that had a gigantic bite scar on its side of its face there, which is obviously a bite from a much bigger white shark. And I was able to extrapolate, for example, that that 18 foot white shark was bitten by a shark approximately the size of Bruce from Jaws, like 25 feet long. And that was furthered out, further evidenced by whale, a whale carcass that uh, one of my associates documented off of Canada. And he measured shark bites, a whole slew of them, on the carcass of a big old dead humpback that had drifted ashore. So these aren't bites that stretched or grew with the animal this feeding damage after the whale was dead you know these bites aren't growing or anything like that um he had one bite that was 31 inches high Mm. and which is enormous and 27 inches wide well that's a yard it's like a meter it's huge Mm -hmm. and then he and there's he sent me a video of him measuring the bites with tape measures and stuff so there's no you know room for doubt here or anything like that and then there was another bite which he didn't realize when he sent me the photos that was next to it that was an even larger bite it was the same width but it was higher and so what had happened apparently is with the smaller bite the shark didn't have to go to maximum gape 
to get a chunk. Oh my! <laughs> but further down, it stretched at its jaws to full extension before it dug in, mm. and that bite was like 38 or 39 inches tall. So we're talking about a, a very, very large white shark, and it's definitely a great white. These particular bites, you can see the shape and everything. But uh, so I went through different formulas from different organizations, websites, and scientific papers, etc., and explored options and got different numbers, etc. But I went with the, the most conservative numbers I could find, the most conservative formulas out there of anything. Because, you know, you want people to say, oh, well, it could have been this, it could have been that. So, you know, at a minimum, the shark that was feeding on that carcass was 25 and a half feet long. At hmm. a minimum. Could have been 30. Okay. But we could safely say that it was over 25 feet, which is an enormous great white shark. Okay. Then there were other, like, sightings and incidents and photographic evidence that went with it. One of them was the... Uh, was in that one of these super predator specials, like they did as a follow-up, where it was called like a uh, 35-foot white shark lurking in a kill zone or something like that. And I got to speak to uh, Kurt Jenner, who was the photographer involved in the, the documentary. And he's out of uh, Australia at the Center for Whale Research. And he took photos of a 69-foot pygmy blue whale that had an enormous bite scar on its peduncle, which is like the... Uh, top, let's say, of the uh, region of the tail right in front of the flukes, mm -hmm. okay? And it's a healed over bite and stuff. And in the, uh, you know, in that documentary, they were extrapolating, it's, uh, confirming first of it was a shark bite, which you can see individual tooth scars once it's enlarged, and um, how big the shark was. And they were saying that the bite was like five feet across and that the shark would have been like 35 to 40 feet long, something like that. So I explore that and with that one I realized that this is my professional or unprofessional opinion but uh, I think that was off a little bit because in this case this was an incident where the bite stretched and I don't mean it grew as the animal grew the pygmy blue was attacked when it was smaller probably a calf um, which it was a horrendous bite and if it didn't have a, uh, its mother with her it may have died or been killed by other sharks from bleeding out etc mm. but uh because of the location of the where the wound was and that you know the top of the tail there that region is constantly moving up and down as the whale swimming vertically you know the flukes right you understand so as it healed and the whale grew that area kind of flattened out let's see so instead of that shallow curve so you're talking it, stretch marks yeah, well, not exactly stretch marks, but the area, like, the depth didn't change, okay, in terms of how deep the bite was. But the lateral But it kind of, too. like, flattened over time. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of see this because a, a white shark with a bite five feet long, even with the most, the, the, the most conservative formulas I could find out there, would be 50 feet long, mm -hmm. not 35 or 40 feet, like, they were saying. Right. See? So instead of it being just the tip of the jaws there, it was actually a more curved bite initially that opened up over time and scarred up, etc. Now that doesn't mean that it was small. Even then, I found that that bite was bigger than the bite on the whale carcass that my friend measured. So, and that, so that shark that attacked the pygmy blue was probably 26 to 30 feet long in my opinion. Still, a Just very a baby. Oh, come on. <laughs> right. Okay. So, I mean, that's in there. And then the craziest one is the one that's in the video trailer there. Um, so people go on. I think you, you have the still in the video trailer that you Yeah, let me, let me go look at radio pictures. In fact, we have images. You're obviously near your computer. Why don't we take a look at some of these images? You've got uh, uh, number two is the whale shark. Number three is the foot... Uh, what, what yeah, the, the whale shark one is the one you want to see. Okay. So that, it has the diver swimming next to it, and that yep. picture was taken by Simon J. Pierce, a uh, top marine biologist, by the way. So the, um, so the whale shark that was photographed off the Galapagos was 40 feet long, and it has a four-foot bite scar, a chunk taken out of its flank, 
on the codal keel. Which is there in the in the in the um, uh, in the video trail. Grab, you yep, can see, see the it. the bite right below the the diver's knees, I think. Right. Now Simon, of course, is obviously as conservative as possible, and he said that the uh, you know it could have grown over time, etc. Um, and I'm not one to disagree with him, but I've studied, um, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb where he won't see because I don't have to answer to <laughs> peers, the scientific community, etc., and all that stuff. But uh, and I, I've studied like whale sharks that have been attacked. You know, photographic evidence of whale sharks attacked by tiger sharks and white sharks and stuff like that. And a lot of these attacks happen the same way what happened to this whale shark. The predator comes up and BAM! Goes for the tail region there, crunches down, and it's trying to cripple its prey. It, same thing would happen with the pygmy blue whale. Okay, they want to take out the means of locomotion. Without the ability to swim, its prey is going to die, bleed mm -hmm. out, die, etc. Like, like when a white shark attacks an elephant seal, they go for the haunches, avoiding the jaws, crippling bite, wait for it to bleed out, etc. So in this case, they wanted to, this shark wanted to hit the whale shark, wanted to cripple it so it couldn't swim anymore, it would drown, die, it, it's feeding time at the zoo. Okay, It didn't work. That caudal keel on the side there is thick ridges of dense skin and stuff like that, that in my opinion is what I call a crumple zone. And it's not just to help the whale shark swim and stabilize its its body, but also to give white sharks something that male that can't hurt the shark mm. itself, the whale shark. See, so the thing gets a, a bite full of like fibrous tissue that probably tastes like garbage, and the whale shark probably smacked it with its own tail and managed to get away. It has to be that because the whale shark swims at like three or four miles an hour. See. So I know big predatory sharks would be slow, but if you can't catch a three mile an hour whale shark, you got a problem. <laughs> okay, you know. So anyway, so whatever happened, happened. So the question is though, is how big is the shark that attacked this whale shark? And if you look at on my in the book on my website, it shows you the links where there's photo evidence of a whale shark before and after one of these bites from a great white and stuff like that, and after about a year, year and a half later. The whale shark's bite has so filled in, it's no longer recognizable from what it originally was. It's like, like you can hardly tell. It just looks like a weird, like lumped area. Mm -hmm. But the bite on that 40-foot whale shark, which is four feet across, okay, you can still see individual tooth marks. Oh my god! And that's in the book. Okay, there's multiple photos that Simon was kind enough to let me use for the book, and you can see grooves where triangular teeth sliced in there. So in my opinion, okay, and I'm just a layman, but in my opinion, that bite is not like 10 or 20 years old when this whale shark was much smaller. It's probably six months old, maybe. Hmm. Nowhere near a year, the year and a half from the stuff. Which the means whoever bite. had the big jaws <clears throat> is still the with us. As the whale shark. Though. It wasn't, like the bite is pretty much the size it was when it took place is what I'm trying to say. Right. So that indicates once again, with our most conservative formulas for measuring, estimating shark size based on bite diameter, okay, that suggests a predatory shark about the same size as the whale shark, which was 40 feet long. Hmm. So this is very strong evidence indicating that there is some sort of large macro predatory shark out there that gets you know, the size of what people sometimes Wait. say they see, and everybody says, oh, it was a basking shark. You just saw a basking shark. It was a whale shark. It was a whale. You know, this type of stuff. Yeah. But which, which of course, brings up the, this intriguing question I've wondered about for years. We seem, as a species on land, to have this mm -hmm. compulsive kind of, you know, obsession with sharks culminating in sci-fi channel in idiocy, sharknado, and all that stuff what is it about sharks given that most of us live very far and will never ever meet one or see one or be attacked by one what is it that makes sharks popular mass entertainment food for a general population because they eat people sometimes and a shark attack on a person is horrific with those razor sharp teeth they carve out huge chunks of flesh there's a lot of blood there's a lot of terror and if one decides it's like a bull shark that it's not going to let go you know the fatalities the experience is horrific and people lose limbs you know get 
disemboweled, I mean, all sorts of stuff. So, a shark attack is a terrifying thing. Yeah, but thing the number of people them. on Earth who are attacked by sharks in any given year is like, what, on one hand. Why do we have this culture-wide obsession? Or is it driven by media that are basically selling fear porn? Well, I mean, Jaws obviously had a huge impact. Yeah. The movie. So, but that was a major I mean, super-produced movie with, you know, great stars. Mm -hmm. um, well, look at a killer whale. A killer whale is bigger and more powerful than any proven predatory shark. Right. Um, they eat white sharks, and I strongly suspect that whatever macro predatory shark is bigger than a white shark is strongly kept in check, by the way, by killer whales, who seem to enjoy taking down big sharks, basking hmm. sharks, whale sharks, etc. And I would bet dollars to donuts that if they encountered one of these sharks and it's, you know, 25, 30, 35 feet long, they're going to have a field day with it. I mean, it's like, you know, a shark that size is going to be, 40 foot shark is going to be so slow. <laughs> Honestly, it would be like two Messerschmitts attacking a dirigible. <laughs> okay. Except that there's that not that much size difference between them, you know, and they'll hmm. rip it to pieces. And they do this, not just because... Because one has a skeleton and the other is cartilage. Yeah, but... And, and they want that liver. And they also seem to have some sort of animus at, at times, it seems, towards sharks, big predatory sharks. You mean it might be cultural? I think, I mean, like they have those two off, 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 was it off South Africa. There's these two bull orcas that tag team out there and wiped out every white shark in the area. They, I think their names are Port and Starboard because their <laughs> fins bend to opposite directions or something like that. You know, I believe they were responsible for a couple of years back for all the influx of white sharks showing up on the West Coast and stuff because they run for their lives, mass migration away from their natural predator. Mm. See, well, my point is, is killer whales are not generally viewed by people as being terrifying, even though in captivity they have killed people. But in the wild, they generally tend to not do this. See, mm. so. As opposed to a shark, which is not anywhere near as intelligent, obviously, and when it kills a person, it's horrible, it's horrifying. And if workers were doing this in a regular way, they'd be much better at it. They're smarter, they're sneakier, they have sonar, they're organized, they're pack hunters. You know, if they wanted to really go to town on people, but they're smarter, smart enough to not do that. They know better. Hmm. So a shark is much more terrifying. Which thing. raises all kinds of questions about consciousness etc you know is there a, a communal thing an identification mm -hmm. you know between cetaceans and humans at a species level you know we're more related remember we are related ultimately to whales way Same way, body way, way way back yeah you know, i didn't know that that's interesting mm -hmm. okay let's switch gears i want to end on this i want to do two things one is <clears throat> You're not just a guy that writes about this stuff and researches 24-7 like some others of us. Mm -hmm. You've actually had a string of very strange personal experiences. So tell me about the juvenile Sasquatch swimming that you saw. Okay. Um, I think we can, we'll be able to squeeze that in. i got to have to talk fast, though. <laughs> um, I mean, all the, de the details are in Monsters and Marine Mysteries, but uh, at the time, I had no idea what I saw. Understand? This was 30 years ago almost, or something like that. And uh, we were up in Connecticut. It was we? Me, me and two of my knucklehead brothers. Okay. Okay. We'll call them Tweedledee and Tweedledum. <laughs> but anyway, so me and uh, D and Dum, okay, <laughs> we, are, at the time, my family had a house on the lake, Candlewood Lake, in Danbury, Connecticut. No. Oh. And uh, Candlewood Lake is a very big lake. It's got 50 miles of coastline. And connected to it is, is Squance Pond, which is like a, maybe a two-mile long lake, which is technically, I think, part of Candlewood. And Squance Pond is part of Squance National Park or something like that, which is government land, like protected. Okay? So you can go in there. There are houses on one side of the lake only. And then it's lake, wilderness, mountains, whatever. Okay? So... That Swans Pond is separated from Candlewood by a causeway, like a narrow one or two lane highway, like road that's built up between the bodies of water, which were originally one, by like piled up rocks. And there's like a concrete 
steel reinforced concrete tube like opening deep under the water that connects the two so water could flow back and forth and so marine uh, marine life sorry so lake creatures like beaver and fish etc can swim back and forth between the lake mm. small okay so we decided you know we said okay well it was crappy weather last night so we don't really want to go into the woods or work our way around we're going to just go fish the causeway so we went over there and we set up shop on the squant side of things and we had our buckets of live minnows and our rods and whatever and stuff. This was early. We got there like crack of dawn. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been raining all the night before. It had just barely cleared up. The sky overhead was gray as anything. A lot of mist on the water. Nobody on the lake. Water was flat like glass. Mm. Okay. And, but very murky because, you know, all the washed stuff that, you know, whatever comes down. From the rain. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, kind of like a dark tea color or something like that. It is. And, um, yeah, which fishing sucked. But, you know, we didn't know that at first. <laughs> so we put out our baits and we weren't getting anything. And after X number of minutes, whatever, D and Dum decided, we're going to go fish the other side. So they go up the, the gravel or rock hill, cross the little road, and go down the opposite side. So they're in a straight line run maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 feet away from me. You know, but obviously you have to go up and across and down. Okay, if I yell, they could hear, hear me. Let's say. Okay, so I figured, screw them. I'm going to stay here and fish my side, and I'm going to catch a big bass, and they're going to be jealous. So I'm sitting there <laughs> catching. You know, yeah, you know how brothers are. So yeah, I know, I know. Fortunately, I am the best fisherman. So. <laughs> anyway, um, so then all of a sudden, like some, some weird thing shows up in the lake. And it's, it's back there a ways. I don't know if it was 100 feet, something like that. If I stood um, and measured, looked at landmarks, I could really estimate better. But it pops up on the surface of the water. I notice it. It's there for a second, bobs up, and then it goes under. This is well offshore, right? Uh, I'm standing on the causeway or sitting by the rock, on the rocks, looking at the lake. Mm -hmm. And it's in the lake. Okay, I don't know how deep the water is there, 20, 30 feet. Uh, I really don't know. But, um, and... Then it comes up again, and it's a little bit closer, and it goes under. And it stays under each time for, I don't know, 30 seconds, mm. um, I'm guessing. But, um, and I started realizing it was hairy. Mm. You know, I could see, like, this roundish sort of dome-like thing covered with reddish-brown hair. So at first I went, That's, oh, it's a muskrat. And I'm like, no, way too big. I'm like, it's a beaver. You know, I thought that was the, I've seen the body of the beaver, but it wasn't. It, that was just a head. I'm like, that's not a beaver. You know, I'm like, is that a deer? You know, I'm like, I have no, I have no idea what I'm looking at now. So I'm starting to look at it more, and it's like it comes to the surface again, and now I see it's long, like maybe five feet long, I guess, or something. And again, this is at a distance, so I could be off, but I was starting to think it was a like a really big Irish setter, it was sort of like <laughs> that color, but, you know. And it was like that it was red, reddish orange kind of, okay. almost like a beaver color. Okay. But um, believe me, I saw when I saw it closer the hair and stuff. It was definitely like a beer, reddish orange, reddish brown, something like that. But um, and now I'm looking at it and I see it when it comes up and I, it has like a head. The head's the lead part and it's kind of like dome shaped, and hairy, and it, the rest of it's behind it. And I'm like looking. I'm like it sort of looked like legs behind it, you know. <laughs> and when it swam, it was the weird part. It swam with the legs together, like a whale dolphin or a person in a mermaid suit you know hmm. like that type of thing okay and it would go under and then it would come up again a little closer and i think whatever this thing was it was catching crayfish and eating them because those rocks and stuff that are piled up to form the causeway they go way out there you know it formed like this big slope thing mm -hmm. okay it came up and stuff and there's a lot of crayfish down there and these rocks some of them are like you know six eight inches across or more and then smaller ones or whatever um so it's about, I'm going to say, 60 feet away, maybe, at this point. I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm spitballing. But, um, and I'm looking, I'm like, what the hell is that? You know, I'm like, I have no idea. You know, I see, like, a head. I see this long thing. I think I see legs together, like, you know, every so often it goes under. You know, it wasn't a deer. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a mountain lion. You know, it wasn't anything I could identify, Okay. And so I, I started trying to adjust my position. I wanted to get up a little higher on the rock so I could see down on it better, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. And uh, I, I might have had a camera with me, or the, the knuckleheads had it. I don't know, but there wasn't time. <laughs> and um, so 
as I do this, I, I dislodge like a, a couple of rocks. You know, there's a lot of small ones that it, it clattered, and the thing must have heard me. And as I, I, it did, it sounded, as I call it, like it went under. Right. And this time, it went under faster. And as it went under, its arm, and it had an arm, broke the surface. And I saw its left shoulder and its left upper arm and its elbow and its forearm. And it had an elbow, okay? And I don't know any animal other than a primate that has an elbow and a shoulder like that and stuff like that. Its arm was like the size of mine. And I got pretty big arms, by the way. You know, lifting. Um, but it was covered with longish, soaked, obviously, hair. Hmm. And as it came up, you know, the, the shoulder, upper arm, to the wrist, let's say, was above the surface of the water. Almost like a person doing, like, a crawl stroke, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But not, it didn't do that. And then it went under. Like I said, it was completely submerged. I'm like, what the hell is that? I'm, it was like a chimpanzee or something like that, you know? Like, like that's what the arm looked like, remind me of. But it was reddish orange reddish brown so now i'm like and much bigger than a chimpanzee well yeah i i, I estimate it was like about five feet long. so but it, when i say that it was 70 feet away or something like that but i'm guessing so but like i said the arm was like about the size of mine so i don't know what that means okay but uh now it was underwater and it, it made a beeline through the tunnel that goes between the two lakes swimming and i couldn't see it Clearly, I saw like a dark shadow before me, the disturbances it went through. So I'm like, holy crap. So now I rush up the rocks and I, I cross <laughs> over across the road, almost got creamed by a car, somebody running for work or who knows what. And I go over and I'm start telling my brothers about the hairy red thing, as I was calling it. Okay. I didn't know Bigfoot from my mother in law at the time, or did I? But anyway. <laughs> So I'm like, guys, guys, check it out. There's this hairy red thing, and it's like got arms like a person, and it's going to come through on this side right now, right now. Look, look. But it was faster than I was. By the time I got up and crossed, it had, it had already gone through, apparently. And we're standing there we're like, yeah, right, you're full of it. You know, bite me, whatever, and stuff like that. <laughs> and then off to the left there, I don't know, it was the, the shore was like, I don't know, 100 feet away, this part. There was all these lily pads on that side woods go and so the like garden and it like I'm, i think it was it something was disturbing things in the lily pads it was like things are moving and thrashing through there and stuff like that and i mean it could have been a huge fish got caught up but i don't think so i think it was in the lily pads and working its way along or something like that but i never saw anything more of it than that and it wasn't until like you know recently like a few years back or something, I'm like, I think this was a Bigfoot. Like, you know, a, a young Bigfoot swimming in, in the lake. And I, I researched it, and online I found a, like a newspaper article or something about fishermen in that lake reported seeing what they were calling a hairy wild child. Oh my gosh. And researchers that do this stuff, you know, because this is not my area, tell me that back then nobody used the term bigfoot or anything like that and that when they encountered something like that they would call it a hairy whatever like a hairy wild child or something like that hey or hairy yeah we're out of room oh, we've sorry. run out of runway hey i want to thank you my guest this morning has been max hawthorne who not only is a student of the creatures of the deep but he seems to have had a very interesting proclivity for intriguing sightings in his own right um, what can I say? Stay away from the ocean for a long while. Kind of watch where you are. And do not, do not, do not, whatever, uh, you know, get eaten until next week when we all can get together again. And until then, same time, same bat channel. Remember, third star on the left, straight on till morning. Good night, everyone.